This is your AP Gov video on the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court is the highest court in the land. It is uh, outlined in the Constitution under Article 3. And the number of justices on the court, just like all judges, is determined by Congress. We currently have eight associate justices and one chief justice. The chief justice is appointed by the president, but the chief justice gets to keep that title until they leave the court. So once a chief justice is there, that is currently John Roberts, he will keep that until he dies or retires. And then at that moment, whoever is the president can pick one of the confirmed judges um, to serve as the chief justice. The Supreme Court is referred to as the court of last resort. Its decisions are fairly final, at least until the foreseeable future. The only thing that can overturn a Supreme Court decision is either a constitutional amendment or a future Supreme Court with a similar case um, in which the court would then change the decision. There is no appeal on a Supreme Court decision. It is final. The main job of the Supreme Court is judicial review, and this is determined in the case Marbury versus Madison. Judicial review is the ability of the Supreme Court to determine whether things are legal and constitutional. So in Marbury versus Madison, this is the case of the midnight judges. The outgoing president, uh, um, upset that his party did not win the presidency, decides to use his power and his party's majority in the Senate to increase the number of judges in the federal system. Uh, the Senate approves that. They appoint a number of people from their own party to these positions. The next morning, when the new president and secretary of state come in, they see this and are very upset by it. In Marbury versus Madison, uh, the justices interpret that these judges do get to keep their jobs because legally and under the Constitution, judges get to keep their jobs if they are appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. But they also use the decision to explain that the co Congress and the president um, are not immune and that the Supreme Court could decide uh, to make things that they have done unconstitutional. So they can basically stop the Congress or stop the president from doing things that are not legal under the Constitution. The Supreme Court can also overturn previous Supreme Court decisions. So here is a great example. Brown versus the Board of Education overturned a previous Supreme Court decision in Plessy versus Ferguson. Plessy versus Ferguson was the case where they said separate but equal. Um, and as long as you know you had separate but equal facilities for black and white people, then that was legal. Um, and that was you know the prevailing legal notion at the time. And that also made it government recognized and government enforced legal segregation. We know that this, of course, did not create equal places, um, equal uh, restaurant facilities, equal government facilities, equal schools. So in Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954, the Supreme Court decided to overturn the separate but equal doctrine. And this forced desegregation of the schools, saying that schools that are segregated are inherently unequal because people learn from being around people with different ideas, different opinions, learning new things. So race-based school segregation is a violation of the 14th Amendment, which has a clause that's called the Equal Protection Clause. It says that states have to protect all citizens equally. So you, the state government cannot treat some citizens differently than others. There was also a second Brown versus Board of Education, which was passed the following year, and it forced school districts and states to desegregate schools quicker. Um, a number of states and, and local school districts were upset by this ruling and did not want to desegregate. So this second Supreme Court decision made them speed up that process. It is a very controversial decision. It certainly was at the time, maybe not so much today, but it motivated a lot of policy responses. This really amplified the civil rights movement um, schools and desegregation became, um, a, you know, a sticking point and a rallying cry. A lot of sit-ins and things like that came about throughout the late 50s and 60s. The Supreme Court's work schedule is October through June, so they do get a three-month summer break. And they hear cases Monday through Thursday, and then Fridays they use that for deliberation amongst themselves. The deliberation amongst the Supreme Court justices is secret and there's no transcript kept. 
the trial in front of the Supreme Court is each attorney, each side gets one attorney and they get 30 minutes to speak in front of a panel of Supreme Court justices. Now, during that 30 minutes, uh, the justices can interrupt, the justices can ask questions, they can talk amongst themselves, but each side gets exactly 30 minutes. And once it's done, um, the justices will, again, deliberate in private, make decisions, and they can actually deliberate as long as it takes. So not just once, but over time. And then they will decide what the vote will be, and then they have to write the opinion. All of that happens in secret, and we don't actually know what the decision is until the opinion is published. So the court itself um, writes official opinions. The majority opinion of the court is what is called the official opinion of the court. That is the legal um, decision that will serve as a precedent for all future cases. It is the one that will be required to be enforced by law and by lower courts in the future. Anybody that disagrees um, with the majority, um, they pick somebody in the minority of vote to write a dissenting opinion. This is the opinion of why the justices in the minority did not agree with the majority opinion. And then anybody in the majority can also write a concurring opinion. So if you agree with the decision, but maybe for different reasons, um, or you want to add some different arguments to it, you can also write a concurring opinion. So it's possible that with every decision, you could have up to nine opinions, the majority opinion of the court being the one that sets precedent. Now, depending on who is on the Supreme Court and whether you think uh, the Constitution would uphold whatever thing you're interested in, there are ways to get around the Supreme Court. You could, of course, amend the Constitution, which takes a two-thirds vote of the House and Senate and then three-quarters votes of states to agree. The Supreme Court has to interpret things that are in the Constitution, so you can just, of course, change what's in the Constitution. A lot of times, instead of going through the court system, you pass legislation in a legislative branch or in the federal Congress, and this will change the way that laws are carried out, and you can also mitigate problems. You can close loopholes. You can uh, get rid of conflicting laws that make it confusing for some people. You can also, you know, repass a law in a different way. You can start over. And so the legislative branch does most of the daily action with how laws are being enforced. And you really only want to go through the courts if you want to change something for the long term. Now, remember, the courts and the Supreme Court justices, they don't enforce laws. The executive branch enforces laws. So when the courts make a decision, it's ultimately up to the executive branch to make sure it's carried out. And there are lots of cases throughout history where the executive branch didn't like the decision. Um, they dragged their feet. They stalled. And of course, you know, local and state governments, if you just think about uh, segregation, a lot of local areas, you know, places in the South did not want to enforce federal or Supreme Court decisions around segregation laws. You can also use the president's power to appoint judges and the Senate's confirmation of judges to kind of change the types of judges that are on the courts. Um, we generally do not have justices and judges run for office, so we don't know what political party they're from. But if you look at their body of work and how they decide cases, we can find out if they interpret the Constitution in a more conservative or liberal way. And that will help a uh, member of the, of the president's staff and the Senate to determine if they like where this judge um, or how this judge would determine cases. We also have um, instances where state governments ignore or stall Supreme Court decisions. And we, of course, have the impeachment process, which is outlined in the Constitution. Impeachment needs to be for treason, bribery, or high crimes and misdemeanors, but judges can also be impeached for those things as well. You can also have Congress change the number of judges or justices on the court, just like in the case of the midnight judges from Marbury versus Madison. It would it would take the Congress to pass a law to increase those. Whoever was the president at the time would get to appoint people to those open positions, and then the Senate would confirm each of those individual judges or justices. Um, Congress can also change the jurisdiction of the courts, which is what types of cases go to which court. Um, those things are outlined. Everything but the Supreme Court is outlined in Article One, which gives Congress lots of authority on how to do that. 